And Father, bless the message today. Father, as we look at the message that you've given, would we learn, Father, from your word? Would you just give us a teaching from your word? Use my voice, Father, but let, let what we understand and what we hear be from you and through your word. We ask that blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Fake news? Is there such a thing as fake news? No. Sometimes the news is so bad you just don't even want to watch the news, right? And then some of us are news junkies, and you got to keep up on all of it, and there's all this stuff happening around the world. Uh, <laughs> how close it is to the end, right? It feels like it is, doesn't it? It certainly does. Yeah, it's some crazy stuff going on out there. But one of the things that's in the news, it's been in the news for a long time, many years, actually many generations. There's one thing that's been in the news that's a hot spot. I'm telling you, it is a big, big hot spot. It's a controversy that's been raging for a very long time, and it's over a piece of property. And there have been wars over this piece of property. Okay? Does anybody know what this place is? Yeah. In Israel, Jerusalem, and particularly a plot of ground right here, 37 acres, called the Temple Mount. Now, this Temple Mount has been the source of great wars and great pain because Christians, Jews, Muslims all lay claim to a piece of property there. This is probably the most notable, the, the Dome of the Rock, they call it, uh, it's a shrine is what it is. It's a shrine. They do have a mosque there, a uh, Muslim mosque right here, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. But this has been the focus mostly, the uh, Dome, Dome of the Rock. Because it's a very special piece within that 37 acres. That Under that dome is a very special piece of property. Okay? It's, it's a rock. It's a ledge that has significance. It's a holy place to uh, Christians, Jews, and Muslims for different reasons. It's, it's simply a place that each of those lay claim to, and so there's been lots of wars over these kinds of things. So what's up with this place? Why is this place so special? What, what is the deal about that? Why is this such a controversy? Why have there been so many wars over this little postage stamp of a place that everybody is very concerned about? And I think you're going to find it in the future. You're going to hear a lot more. There's going to be a lot more stuff going on having to do with that, that rock. Okay? So what's the deal with that? What is it about that place? Is it a place that God is in? A lot of people believe that it is, and I believe that it is. But here's the thing about places. That place in our word, in, in, in the word of God, is first described in Genesis chapter 22. And, and God makes reference to this place very, very early on in the Bible. It's the, it's the story of Abraham and the promise to Abraham that he would have generations of children, so many descendants you couldn't even count them. It's like trying to count the stars or count the sand grains. It's just so many. And then God turns around after he provides at, uh, Abraham with a son, Isaac, and Abraham's 100 years old. And, 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 and Sarah is 90. Can you imagine that, ladies? And, and that was old back in that day, okay? It was. But to have a child would have been considered to be impossible. God gave him that, and then as the child grew and was a young, young child, we're not exactly sure the exact age, but God said this. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Ouch. Can you imagine as a parent being told this? 
It doesn't even make any sense. Why would God do this? And, and a lot of criticism of, of the Bible, of Christianity, of history, of, of the Jewish uh, religion, is what kind of God would do that? What kind of God would tell you to take your son and sack? There's something wrong with that. Okay, that's usually what you hear from the people who don't understand what's really going on here. Okay, go to the region of Moriah. There was a place, a specific place that he wanted him to go. Okay, and it was his only son whom you love. So what kind of God would do that? Well, I'll tell you what kind of God would do that. A God that stopped Abraham. A God that sent an angel of the Lord to stop him. He, it was a test of faith to see if he would even give up his only son because God required it. And, of course, Abraham was willing to do that. So what kind of God would, make, would do such a terrible thing? Well, how about a God who actually did that himself? How about a God who had an only son whom he loved? Only he didn't stop, did he? His son was sacrificed for you, for me, to take away our sins and to cover our death. That's what kind of God would do that. All right? Mount Moriah is a place where God was sending Abraham to. By the time we get later on in the years, this is in, say, King David's day, many, many years later, the city of David, which is lower Jerusalem, it was, became Jerusalem after David conquered it, and it, he placed it as the capital of Israel. Does that sound familiar? The capital of Israel. And this lower city was on a slope, a slope leading up to a couple ledges. Opel is one, which is a slight slope here, but it's a, a ledge. And then Mount Moriah is another ledge here. And this spot is the spot that we're talking about today because it is a sacred place. And it is the place that Abraham was told to go sacrifice his son. It's Mount Moriah. Okay? So that's the first time we see that place come into play. Another time is in 2 Samuel 24. 2 Samuel 24, it's another story. This time it's King David. And King David sinned against God, and it was such a grievous sin that God was sending a plague to Israel, a plague to the people, and the only way to stop it, is stop the plague, is God instructed David to build an altar on Mount Moriah and offer a sacrifice. God, this is what God told him to do. Go to the same place, the same spot that he told Abraham to go to. All right? David decides to buy that plot of land. He bought it from a man named Arana. Okay, and, and Aaron I was going to just give it to him. But David said this. He said to Aaron, no, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. And so that's why today, I mean, when people talk about who lays claim to the, I mean, David actually purchased this spot, okay? So that's why the Jewish um, culture believes that they own that spot, okay? It belonged to Aaron, though. He was the owner of it, okay? And it was a threshing floor. Do you know what a threshing floor is? We're going to see what that is in a minute. It has to do with the harvest. It's a threshing floor. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered his prayer on behalf of the land, and the plague on Israel was stopped. So David did as he was told. He offered the sacrifice, and the plague was stopped. You know what I find interesting about this? I find this very interesting. In behalf of the land, I guess I would have thought that God would stop it on behalf of David or on behalf of the people or on behalf of the nation. He, it was on behalf of the land. There was something about that land that was special. God had reserved. Okay? That's a threshing floor. In fact, this is an artist's rendition of Aaron's threshing floor. It's a place to take your wheat and barley. You spread it. You grind it. You take it out here. You throw it up in the air. You pitch it. 
the grains that are separated after the grinding, they fall to the ground into like a little pile, and the chaff blows away. That's why it needs to be on a higher ledge, so that the wind blows away the chaff. It's all part of the harvest. And there's harvesting that's happening on this threshing floor. And of course, down here, you see the ledge of Opel down to King David's palace down in the city of David, which is actually a very small part, portion of Jerusalem today, the city of David. It's really expanded out. Okay, so <clears throat> this is where the threshing floor is. This is where the harvest took place. It's where de, uh, God instructed Abraham to take Isaac and sacrifice. It's where God instructed uh, David to do his altar and sacrifice to God on behalf of the land. Interesting. Okay, the next time we see that spot talked about is in Second Chronicles. And we know that after David, there was to be a temple built. And this is to replace the portable temple, the, the tabernacle that was going from place to place when the Israelites were in the wilderness. But now that they were in the land of Israel and now that God had given them the promised land, they were to build a permanent temple to the Lord, a house of God. Only David wasn't to build it, his son Solomon was given instructions to build it. So we see here, then Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. You see the place? Where the Lord had appeared to his father David, it was on the threshing floor of Aronah, the Jebusite, the place provided by David. It's the same spot. That's where the temple was built. And they did. They built this grand temple, and it shows up on Mount Moriah. I just superimposed a picture of, a, of the artist's rendition of what the temple might have looked like on that spot. And so you would go from the city of David up through the hill of Opel to the temple to worship God. It was the house of God built by Solomon and dedicated by him to God. Okay, you got all that? Special place. Special place, isn't it? But then we find in Hebrews chapter 3, something's changed a little bit. Something has switched around just a little bit. Because the Hebrew writer says this, Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house. And what he's referring to, Moses was obviously before David. And in the, in the whole thing with the tabernacle, and, which is the portable temple, and God's house being that tabernacle, but also really kind of being the, the nation of Israel. He's saying, the Hebrew writer saying, is Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. Important stuff, right? But then he says this, but Christ is faithful as the son over God's house. There's been a change that has taken place. Jesus is now over God's house. Not Moses, not, not David, not Solomon, not the priests, but Christ is the son over God's house. And then he says this next. He says, and we are his house. We are his house. Say that with me. We are his house. So this change that has taken place, it's not about going to a place. It's not about going to Mount Moriah. It's not about the big stone. It's really about, it's come down to this. It's come down to the church. And we are the, we are the house. Okay? If indeed, oh, there's an if, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence in the hope in which we glory. So that sounds like we could be in God's house or we could opt out of God's house, I suppose. But there's a thing that says if we hold firmly to our confidence, the good news, the gospel. Okay, I want you to remember that phrase, hold firmly. We're going we're gonna to come back to that, okay? Lock it in. We're going to come back to that. Hold firmly to the confidence and the hope in which we are glory because we are his house, but we need to hold firmly. Okay? So the house of God, 
used to be the big deal. It was on behalf of the land that God did all this, but now we are the house of God. So if we are the house of God, why do we need this building? I mean, if we're the house of God, we could meet anywhere, couldn't we? We could meet at the mall. There's lots of empty space out there. Anybody been to the mall lately? We could go to the mall and... and, and, and <laughs> or we could be in somebody's house. Or we could be in a barn. It doesn't really matter where we would be if we are God's house. Well, maybe it doesn't matter as much, but here's the thing. God has a thing a special affinity to places. And we see it throughout Scripture. Places are important. We don't worship the place. We are the house of God. So do we need a place? And I stood up before you uh, a year and a half ago, maybe a little more than that, and when we were talking about the need to buy this church, buy this property, um, we decided that we needed to know why we were doing that. Why do we need to buy the church? Why do we need the six acres? And we developed a uh, vision statement, okay, for why we need our church building. Before we do, would do such a thing, we needed to know why we were doing this. And so we took some time. We talked about what was important. You, we prayed about it. We look, looking at what scripturally what God is asking us to do, we came up with this statement. This is just our own statement as to why we need the church building. To train, equip, and prepare disciples in sharing the good news with all others, especially outside our walls. You are here to be trained, equipped, prepared. We only spend a few hours here a week. Um, most of the time we're out there, aren't we? We come here to be prepared, to be equipped, to be trained. You are here today. You are, being, you are being prepared so that you can share, so that you can share the good news. There's a lot of fake news out there. There's a lot of bad news out there. We are the carriers of the good news, and we need to know how to do that. So we need to have a place to do that. And I suppose we could do that anywhere, right? The second part we developed that we need a place to do the ministry of Jesus in our community. We need a place to do the ministry of Jesus in our community. So I, what we're really trying to say is we flow in, we're trained, we're prepared, we're equipped. We flow out to do the ministry of Jesus. And we need a place to do that. And we need a place that the community knows that we're here. We need a place that says uh, we're a beacon, we're a lighthouse, we're a, 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 a saving station for people to come. That needs to be real to people. They need to see that. So with this in hand, we've decided we need to purchase this building and this property. Okay. Now, we didn't know exactly how we we're going to do that. I mean, I stood up before you and I says, look, I don't know how this is going to work. We don't have the money to buy this. If you remember that, I told you that, okay? But these two things right here are important, so maybe God is opening the doors for us to do it, but we just don't know how it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out. And then I read to you Zechariah 4.6. Zechariah 4.6 is kind of a foundational verse for us. Um, I have a mug at home that has it on it, and it has the whole thing, and I, every time I look at that mug, I'm reminded of how this was going to happen. Okay. Zechariah 4, 6 says, he said to me, Zechariah says, God is telling Zechariah to say something. He says, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Now, the reason that's important is Zerubbabel 
was charged with rebuilding the temple because it was destroyed. That Solomon's temple, it was destroyed because Israel turned away from God. God lifted his hand of protection and he allowed not only the temple to be destroyed but Jerusalem to be sacked and burned. And then 70 years later, they come back and rebuild a new temple. It's not as grand, not as nice. But Zerubbabel is the one who was sent in charge to make that happen. Zerubbabel, how'd you like to... I don't think that's in very many baby name books, is it? Zerubbabel? Probably not. Okay. I uh, think what the kids could do with that one, huh? So God is sending a message to Zerubbabel through the prophet Zechariah, and he's saying, this is what I want you to tell Zerubbabel. It's not going to be by your might. It's not even going to be by your power but it's going to be by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Because they had a lot of opposition. They were literally trying to build this temple with tool in one hand and spear in the other. Because they had to defend themselves because the community around them did not want to see this happen. So how were they? They were asking the same question. How on earth are we going to do this? And so the message is, well, it's not going to be by your might. <laughs> it's not even going to be by your power. It's going to be by the Spirit of God. And so when I presented that to you, I don't know, it was a year and a half ago, I think, that's what I was hanging on to, <laughs> that it's going to be by the Spirit of God. And so we did some fundraising. And we did a, a lot of small things. Things did grow. God did bless. We did end up to be able to buy this church and property. And, and I, I got to tell you, I, I, I would not have been able to see it coming as to how it, it multiplied and how that worked out. It can only be by his spirit that it did work out. John 15 is another verse that I read to you. And it's coming back to us today, John 15:5. Because this is not going to be our doing. It simply is not going to be our doing. It's got to be God's. Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He wants us to understand Jesus is the vine. He's the one with the roots. He's the one that has the vine. He has the sap, the life that flows in that vine. We're branches. We're hanging on, okay? But he's got the life. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, does that sound familiar? Hold on firmly. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. He didn't say you will produce the fruit. He said you will bear much fruit. Okay? The fruit comes from him through the sap. I'm using an orange. We're probably not going to be growing many oranges around here, so go with me, okay? Just, just go with me on this. We bear the fruit. He produces it. We're branches. And the way that the fruit, is, it, go, it flows through us to the fruit. The fruit is the harvest. And that, what comes out of that are more branches and more fruit. He says, you will bear much fruit. How? If you remain in me, if you hang on, like we read before, apart from me, you can do nothing. You could be a branch and tear yourself away, but you lay on the ground. You're not going to bear any fruit, okay? Jesus is the vine. He is the source of life. We get to participate and be part of that as branches. That's why he invites us to be part of that process, to be part of the harvest. This is a harvest verse, producing fruit. So my question is, how do we, house of God, how do we honor God in the place that he has given us? We believe he's given us this place. We believe that. With, with all my heart, I believe that. So how are we supposed to honor God? How are we supposed to go forward? How are we supposed to say, it's by your spirit, Lord, as we wait, as we look for open doors, as we look for things to happen because we have lots of work to do. We've got a whole back room back here that we want to finish off, which, by the way, we did the concrete work this week, so that part has been, the repairs have been done. We've got other work, though, too. We've got the parking lot. We've got 
Uh, the front of the church needs some attention. The drainage. We got a mortgage. We got to pay down. There's things that have to happen. How, Lord, are, are we going to be able to do that? Well, I'll tell you what. It's not going to be by might or power, is it? It's only going to be by the Spirit of God. So how do we, as house of God, honor God in this place? Because places are important to God, but we don't worship the place, do we? But we need the place as a headquarters to work from. How do we do that? I'm going to show you five things. Five things that I'm asking us to consider. We need to have a constant reminder of the Spirit of God in this place. We need to be continually reminded of the Spirit of God here. And we need to have a constant reminder of his harvest and our part in it. We need those two things to start off with. Those are the two verses I read you, right? How do we do that? How do we have a constant reminder of that? Uh, when we were doing the concrete last week, this is a section that was cut out. This was all busted up. If you're watching this on video, it's probably washed out, so you'll have to go with my description here. Uh, we had to cut out the concrete and replace it, and uh, we found that we had some uh, block problems over here, which is probably why water was getting in, which is probably why the concrete had problems in the first place. A lot of repair went on in that. So we have this room. The concrete's been repaired, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We need to do the walls and the drywall. We need electrical. We need lighting. We need floors. All this need has to happen, and we don't have the money to do all of that. So how are we going to make this happen? How do we have a constant reminder of God's spirit in this place because it's going to be by his spirit that this is accomplished. And how do we have a constant reminder of his harvest in this place and our part in it? Okay? So here's what I've decided to do. Um, we're going to have a reminder in that room. Every time we walk into that room, we're going to have a reminder. I had a couple banners created for this. And you see this... Uh, yeah, it's a steel girder uh, that's part of the steel roof. And you see this beam right here? We're going to hang a couple banners up there so that every time you walk into that space, you see that and you are reminded. Okay? I want to show those to you. Pastor Jim, will you come up and uh, help me out here? <clears throat> They're made of vinyl, so they can get dirty. Okay? Okay, this is going to hang in that space on the girder up here so that when you walk into the room, you are reminded that it is by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty, okay? It is not by our might, by our power. We're going to see that every time we walk in, okay? Does that make sense? We're going to be reminded of this is not going to be our doing, okay? That's going to be the first one. Okay, there's the second Getting there, Pastor. <laughs> and the second one has to do with the harvest. Okay? Let's see, do I have this right side up? Yep. Here. Me too. This is the second banner that will hang from that girder that reminds us that we are the bearers of the fruit, but he is the vine. Okay, if we're going to say it's by his spirit, then it's going to be by his doing, not ours. Okay? And we remain in him and we trust in him. Does that make sense? Okay. This is what, this is the first two things that I believe we need to do is we need to acknowledge God. We need to give it to him. We need to say, Lord, we're helpless before you. We have some funds, yes, we need some additional funds to do what you are asking us to do, and we need to be in prayer as to how that's all going to get accomplished. But you know what? We're, it's his deal. It's his harvest. We're invited to be part of it. Okay? Thank you, Pastor. I think Vanna White should be afraid for her job. <laughs> yeah. You got Pastor Jim coming up. That's amazing. Good job. Okay? So... We're going to start with that. 
Even though work is going to go on around the property, yes, but when we go back in that room, we're going to see that first thing, no matter what work is going on. The third thing we're going to do, we're going to dedicate that space, that place, and this place as well, to God, his spirit, his harvest. How are we going to dedicate that? How are we going to do that? Well, I want to hold a special service. I want to hold a dedication service. It's in your handout. It's in your, your announcements. On Saturday, April 21st, it's not this coming Saturday, it is the following Saturday. I want to do a special service, and we're going to have it back there in that space. And I'm going to need you to come and bring your lawn chair, something to sit on. They'll, there is heat back there. It's not maybe quite as comfortable as this, so dress appropriate. We're going to have a short a dedication. I don't know how long it'll be. It's going to be music and prayers and reading of verses and the verses are all going to have to do with God's provision God is in control of this thing we are not it's all going to have to do that the blessings come from God and we're going to acknowledge him and give that space to him does that make sense okay we're going to do that on that date the 21st okay at 11 o'clock Please come. Please, if you have a verse you want to share that has something to do with God's provision or how God does things, provides, then bring that verse. I want to share as many verses what verse might mean something to you in that. All right? So bring that with you. Those will be scripture readings, prayers, and music. Okay? Uh, We won't have children's programs. Everybody will be there. Okay? But... You know, it's not going to be a long service, and it would be appropriate for kids to come. It's just that it, it's, uh, they're not going to have a program. The fourth thing we're going to do, we're going to dedicate this place in a grand opening. What that means is when we are done, when we are complete with this room, when we are complete and we are ready, we're going to open this up to the public. We're going to have, we're going to flood the, the mailboxes with invitations. We're going to invite our Township leaders and uh, township supervisor and leaders, you even ask them to say a few words. I'm going to invite our state representative to come and to be part of this. We are going to do, we're going to make it as big a deal as we can. If we have to have hot dogs and bouncy houses, we'll do, we'll do all that, whatever. We have to do a lot of planning to figure out what we want to do. But we're going to have a grand opening and we're going to dedicate this place to God in this community. And the last thing is we're going to feature the companies who have helped make it happen. We're going to feature companies. We're already being given special provisions that I'm not at liberty to share with you yet, but we are being given some special um, favors from companies already. What I've got here, uh, I've got a company creating a banner that's going to go on this right-hand side wall. So it's this wall on the other side. It's going to be a big banner, and it's going to have the companies and their logos and their names of those who have helped bring this together. They've either donated some of their services, or if they haven't donated, they've just made a donation in order to be on that banner to say, we helped. And that'll be up for the grand opening. Lots of eyes are going to see it. It's going to stay up for six months afterward during regular church and everything else. We're going to acknowledge the people that have helped us. We've already been helped in some big ways. Okay? Those are the five things that I'm proposing that we're going to do. We're going to start with these two here. And uh, on the 21st, we're going to have a dedication service in that room. Okay? But we still need to to do some fundraising because we don't have all the funds, do we? But we didn't when we bought this church either. We do need to do some fundraising. That means we need to do a few events. We gotta have we gotta be we can't just sit in our lounge chair and say, Lord, it's by your spirit, so you know we're just gonna watch. No, we need to be doing something. Even the disciples and their and the and the people in the crowd, even they had to come up with fishes and loaves, didn't they? What did God do with those fishes and loaves? He's going to do that. He did when we when we made the purchase here. We weren't. We didn't. I. I got to be honest with you. I. I thought to myself, I don't know how we're going to do this, and we did. We we made the purchase 
due to a lot of graciousness of others. But it did happen by the Spirit of God. But we do need to do some fundraising and raise more funds. We have a special account, it's a capital account at the bank to take donations for this. So it goes straight in with all that money that goes into that account. That's all it's used for is this facility. Okay, and so that's the second box you see on the hall table, by the way, is the, uh, the facility fund. So we're going to dedicate this place, this building, this property, and specifically that room as a place to equip, prepare, train, and to be a place where there's good news, to be a place where we're going to do the ministry of Jesus here to our community outward. Does that sound like a good idea to you? Does it, is it, is it make sense? I'm going to end with 1 Timothy because there's something we need to be doing. Yes, we need to do some fundraising, okay. But we also need to do this, and I hope we're already doing it. 1 Timothy 2. Paul says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. All people. Some time ago, we started our prayer drive, and some of you signed up for roads. I hope you're being faithful in those prayers. It, it, please sign up for roads. We are praying for the people in this community. We're praying for people, for, for them to be able to see the good news of the gospel. Okay, And that's one of the things that we can do is pray for them to God open up their hearts and minds. Paul says this, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. This is what God wants. This is his big dream. This is his will. We're just helping being the branches and helping the process. All right? So we need to be busy praying for our community. That's something we definitely must be doing. Okay, please, please think about that. We're going to close with Ephesians 1 because what, it is it, what is it we're going to pray? What is it we're going to say to God? Well, how about this? I pray, and this is Paul giving us instructions, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. That's our prayer. That's why when we begin church and we, and we open it up for names, we do an offering of names. What? To open up the eyes of their hearts. Why? so that they may be enlightened, they may be able to see the good news that is already here. That's something to pray about. So when you drive by people's homes, you pray, Lord, open up the eyes of their heart. Lord, for this house, for this house, open up the eyes of their heart. Do you, do you see how this works? We need to blanket our community with prayer because we are part of the harvest. Mount Moriah was a place of harvest. It was also a place of sacrifice. And God sent his son to die outside of Moriah, but it was in the vicinity, in the land of Moriah, on Golgotha or, or, or Calgary, whichever place. There's a couple traditions there. The place is important, but we are God's house. We're given this place, and we need to we need to use it wisely, and we need to use it for the will of God. And we know for sure we need to be praying. So that's something that we need to be doing. We need to pray that there are, uh, hearts may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope, the good news, know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people. We want that for everyone. That's why we need to be praying for them and for ourselves and, and, and yourselves to have your, your own eyes opened and to l learn and to grow as we continue our Christian walk. So do you see why it's important? We pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. It's about the harvest. Maybe when you saw this picture earlier, you might have been thinking, why is there a fall picture up there? It's about the harvest, whether it's fruit and and on a vine, I mean, I, I should have grabbed some grapes, I guess. Whether it's fruit <laughs> or whether it's wheat and barley on the threshing floor, we're in that place. This is a place of harvest. 
and we pray that the eyes of their hearts, that's what we can be doing. Let's honor God in this place. Let's dedicate this place to him. Let's acknowledge him. Let's say, Lord, it is by your spirit. It's not going to be by our might or power. We need to hang on and don't let go. We need to make sure we remain in him. Be in prayer, okay? That's, that's a blessing that God is giving us right now. Let's be about our Father's business. Well, Father, we thank you so very much. We ask, Father, for your mercy and your grace because, Father, we don't have this all figured out. But we know we don't have to have it all figured out. We know that you are in charge. You've sent your Son, Jesus, to be our Savior. Father, it is through him, the vine, that life comes. We want to thank you that we can be branches, that we can be part of that, that, it can, that we can be part of the harvest. Father, we give our prayers to you. And as we pray for our neighbors and the people on the roads that we have signed up for, Father, and we ask, Father, that, that we would sign up for more roads, but, Father, that we would be faithful in those prayers and we would give them to you as a harvest. Father, we praise your name and we thank you. We ask you to walk with us in life. We acknowledge you and we know it's not by our might or power. We know it has to be by your spirit. And so we give that to you. Father, we praise your name. We praise the name of Jesus, our Savior. Thank you for giving us your only son, the one whom you love. And yet you gave your son to us. That's the kind of God you are. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.